The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Lieutenant Colonel Terrence Lakin served as Chief of Primary Care and Flight Surgeon for the Pentagon's DiLorenzo TRICARE Health Clinic. He is the lead flight surgeon charged with caring for Army Chief of Staff General Casey's pilots and air crew. Lieutenant Colonel Lakin's numerous awards and decorations include the Army Flight Surgeon Badge, Combat Medical Badge, Bronze Star Medal, Meritorious Service Medal, Army Commendation Medal with two Oak Leaf Clusters, Army Achievement Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster, National Defense Service Medal with Bronze Service Star, Armed Forces Expedition Medal, Army Reserve Component Achievement Medal, Army Service Ribbon, Overseas Service Ribbon 6th Award, and the NATO Service Medal. Lieutenant Colonel Lakin has asked, through his chain of command and his congressional delegation, for proof that Barack Obama is constitutionally eligible to serve as his commander-in-chief. He is the highest-ranking and the first active duty officer to go public over this question. It landed him in prison, from whence he has now returned. Lieutenant Colonel Terry Lakin, it is my honor and my privilege to welcome you to the Global Freedom Report. Thank you for having me on the show, Brian. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. You you were in charge caring for the Army Chief of Staff's pilots and air crews. You have a, a laundry list of, of, of lifetime service worth of awards and medals. In other words, you've shown yourself to be a competent and high-quality officer. You're not a kook. In other words, so what happened the first time you, a distinguished and high-ranking officer, raised the question of Obama's eligibility, and with whom did you initially raise the question? Yeah, it was just a, a long story of, you know, probably a year and a half, almost two years, um, trying to address this as I, you know, I, I, I was working full-time and putting in long hours, but... Uh, you know, in my weekends and spare time or when I could address it with supervisors, I was trying to question the issue. And I tried to do it the only way I knew how of uh, submitting a Article 138 of UCMJ, which is a, in our military legal system, people can, can put in questions or concerns through their command. And so I tried that through two separate chains of command, and I... Just didn't receive a an answer that I thought was, you know, a valid answer. Um, I did try and address this with both the, uh, you know, Manders legal team and also legal assistants in the military, and you know, I was kind of essentially stonewalled, and people didn't call me back or said that they didn't know what to do and didn't know how to address this issue. Well, now, I'm curious because media has characterized people who have questioned Obama's eligibility. As, you know, they call them birthers, but they've pretty much characterized them as being conspiracy theorists and kooks and, and, and in some way off, you know, not, not thinking right. But like I said before, you are clearly distinguished. You're, you're uh, you know, a high-ranking officer. You have earned that lieutenant colonel rank you you nobody can look at you especially in the military and think this guy's a nut so how did your superiors receive the question i mean you know i i understand that you know they didn't give you a satisfactory answer but how did they kind of interact with you over it you know, it's just been a variation of everything uh, a lot of, of mostly majority of people nod their heads and say yeah, we think it's an issue, but you know, what do you do? Or, or uh, um, you know, the the naysayers are saying that uh, you know maybe he he submitted his birth certificate and that's uh, met the standard. And you know, other people, it's all the same arguments. You know, uh, perhaps you know he was born here, so he's a citizen. Well, you know, there has to be a little higher standard here. I would hope so. I would hope so. At what point did it become apparent that your questions were causing a situation that was going to get out of hand? Well, I, I, I think I had been trying to, you know, question this internally 
since it came about, uh, but, you know, pretty much out of deadline of, you know, with my deployment. I had been seeking out a deployment before the elections and knew it was my turn and I, I enjoyed deployments and I, you know, thought that I, I provide a valuable service on deployments. I had been lining up a, a job with a unit that was imminently deploying and, and I decided to retract my name from that. Then it was probably six months later when I came up on the short list to be marked for that, uh, surge in Afghanistan. In my opinion, it was just being part of the surge in Afghanistan that President Obama, you know, ordered by his speech that he gave at the West Point, um, pretty much gave me a direct line that I, that I was being ordered by him to go to Afghanistan. What is your current official status with the military? You haven't been discharged. Are you still on active duty or, or what? What's the what's your status? The, the status I'm on, I'm still on active duty and just what they call it, appellate leave. And the appellate leave will, I'll stay on that status until the appeals process is taken out to, to a conclusion. That could be uh, eight, eight months to a year and a half. So, in other words, you are still an active duty officer. In other words, you're still bound by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I am, yes. I am. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody understood that as well. Um, and because, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's appropriate. Now, you were in prison. Why? I mean, what was the official reason and for how long were you incarcerated? I did come down on orders to report to a unit at Fort Campbell that was preparing for deployment to Afghanistan. And uh, several weeks prior to that report date, I informed my superiors that I was not going to report there until I had some assurances that we had a legitimate commander in chief. So pretty much the process went through until... My report day passed, and and the uh, military then calls you in and uh, flags you as as having potential adverse action taken against you, and and I was under investigation for the military crime of not reporting for duty or missing movement. Now, if I'm and again, I may not have this right, so I'll ask you to correct me, but. So did that precipitate a court martial, and the court martial is what landed you in in prison? It it does. It you know they they launched their investigation, and well, also at this time I was ordered to report to my brigade commander to discuss the matter. And I, you know, at, at the time I was had never done anything like this before. I was extremely scared and didn't have any legal representation with me. At the time, and I, I blithely declined. I said I had tried to meet with my commander previously, and uh, didn't see a point of meeting with him again, where anything that I said or did could be held against me further. But uh, and in my my error of that, uh, resulted in more charges of disobeying an order. So. Uh, we went through the military court martial process, several hearings, and then the actual uh, court martial was held in mid December. And I was found guilty of missing movement and disobeying orders and sentenced to six months at Fort Leavenworth. Okay, all right. Now, um, and were you demoted in the process? No, for, for officers, it's uh, you know more difficult for them to take away the rank, but part of my sentence was the six months confinement, and then after my appellate leave is, is through, then I will be dismissed from the Army, which is the equivalent of a dishonorable discharge. And uh, the, the uh, appellate leave, is the matter still in an appeal process, or is it just a formality? Uh, 
Well, a little of both. It's a you know formality, and I have a a new military lawyer that's reviewing the case now, and we'll uh, see if there's you know we'll file briefs in the next few months, uh, several months down the road, and see how things progress with that. No, I, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to clarify the actual issue if I understand it correctly. The whole issue is that as a soldier, whether you're an officer or enlisted personnel, as a soldier, you have to obey legitimate orders. Failing to do so is a punishable offense. However, as a soldier, you are also charged with knowing what are legitimate orders, and if you follow an unlawful order, an illegitimate order, you can also be punished. Is that correct? That, that's a, and without it looking at the actual oath, that's a pretty good interpretation. Uh, now, I would is, imagine. Well, I would imagine that everybody who sat on the court martial understood that. I, I, am I correct? They're all officers on the court martial, correct? Yes, they were. Uh -huh. Okay, so I would imagine something of this sort. Was, now, I don't know how much you can tell us about what happened in the court martial, but I would imagine this issue must have come up, and as officers, they must have been able to relate to it. Was this issue addressed in some forming, or was it just set aside? Well, it's uh, pretty much the motives of my questioning the legitimacy of the commander in chief was not allowed in my defense. It was allowed afterwards for my sentencing. But you know, it, it, it's just a convoluted situation that uh, you know I'm, I'm not sure anybody has a real good grasp on it. Um, you know, my my direct orders were signed by. Somebody that, that you know, as a as a bird, you know, a full bird colonel. Not my orders weren't signed, and you know, President Obama said did not say, Terry Lake, and you're going. But the ultimate authority does come down from the commander in chief, and where that unified chain of command is somehow broken, I, I don't understand it, and no one's ever been able to explain that well enough to me. Were you incarcerated with others, or were you, you know, or were you kept separate? And if you were with others, what was what was the general attitude toward you when you were in prison? Well, um, there's quite a few people knew about me coming in, and certainly in the next, you know, in the first month or two of my incarceration at Fort Leavenworth, I think you know everybody knew. Word gets around pretty fast in prison, but uh, you know, I I was astonished at um, well, I, I I made a lot of made a lot of friends in prison. I mean, there's good people in there. Fellow inmates there were no one ever hassled me. They in fact just the opposite. A lot of them made a point of getting going out of the way and and meeting me and shaking my hand and saying they understand and that they they think there's an issue too. And um, there, I was one of the few officers in there and uh, most of them are enlisted, but the officers and enlisted have different oaths. Uh, enlisted people take an oath to follow the orders of their superiors and um, officers have a unique oath, which is to protect and defend the Constitution. Oh, I didn't know that that difference was there. Oh, interesting. So the constitutional oath is only with the officer. It is. Right. So, you know, as an enlisted person, I don't really think that they have as much, uh, or, or they wouldn't be able to have this kind of questioning of, of orders. Interesting. Oh, that really is. That is interesting. Did... Um, did your time in prison teach you anything new? Um, it allowed me a lot of time to read, and it just uh, gave me time to, to 
read read the Bible and and read some other uh, historical texts that I read about our founding fathers and more on the Constitution and it just grounded me in my faith and in my belief in the Constitution and and its Judeo-Christian uh, anchors there. So uh, I, while you I while you were, that time. While, while you were in prison, were you um, did you have like a cellmate or cellmates, or did they have you like in isolation? Well, the initial two weeks was in isolation. They they called it reception, but it was basically you're in a separate part of the prison and you're only allowed out outside for you know do one or two hours a day to play cards with some of the other guys or that are in the reception um, classification. But in the general population, I, I did have a roommate. Um, you know, became a wonderful friend, uh, very talented and. To an extremely great sergeant that was in the army, and and uh, you know, I, my my heart goes out to a lot of the fellow inmates, and I think they're a, a lost population in the military that are good, productive people, and maybe many of them uh, shouldn't be in there or shouldn't be in for the time that they are. This time. I have a place in my heart for those lost groups, and, and also I still have my prayers and heart that goes out to the, the troops deployed and their families. What about friends and family? How have they been both during your time in prison and now that you are again free? I was just extremely supportive. Uh, you know, I have a wonderful family, and the, the friends and neighbors have, have all this tried to support uh, the family throughout this process and you know, express concern and, and fear about what, what's kind of going on with our country nowadays. How does it feel now that you're out? I mean, you know, I, obviously it's going to feel great on some level, but you know, are, you a different, are you a different man now that you're out from prison than you were before you went in? I, I'm more grounded in my Christian faith, um, but, but I think I'm, I feel just more grounded in everything. I, I don't think that it's changed my outlook much on anything. I've just had more of a historical or you know, a better background in it. And I, I wish I had paid more attention to, you know, civics and history growing up and through high school and college. No, they don't, they don't even teach that much these days. And, and if, if, if you and I were in high school and college today, we probably wouldn't have much of an opportunity for civics lessons. That's unfortunate. What do you think should be done concerning establishing the constitutional eligibility of future presidential and vice presidential candidates? So that this never happens again. So that it's really clear to all members of the military. Okay. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, you know, I, I think it should be an easy thing for the states to, you know, pass laws to make sure that validation of eligibility is is paramount for the, you know, candidates that are running in all the elections. I, I don't know how that. Safeguard got got missed in our state laws, or you know, even in our federal laws. You know, I every now and then I ask the question, and of course nobody's been able to answer. I've asked, I've asked attorneys, I've asked legislators. Nobody's been able to answer because it's brand new ground. But I've asked the question: if if suddenly it came out, we had absolute proof that indeed Barack Obama was not eligible to be Commander in Chief. It's after the fact. What would happen? Do you have any idea? Want to take a shot at it? No, I I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> no, I know. I, you know nobody, I mean, nobody can even think about it. Um, you know, because it's never come before. And you know, how do we undo everything at this point in time? I don't. I don't have an answer. 
I'm hoping somebody out there does. We have a question from uh, the um, chat room. Um, is there a pledge? Um, is there a pledge anywhere in the military that is a pledge of allegiance to the president or to Obama? You would find that wording somewhat in the enlisted oath of, oath of office, but not, not in the officer's oath. Definitely. So, so indeed, because the question was whether officers pledge allegiance to the Constitution and whether enlisted pledge allegiance to the president. Um, that's kind of the gist of what the, uh, what the questioner was asking. So essentially you're saying that that really is the case on some level. Yes, yeah, that is. Well, interesting. Um, enlisted men don't have the dis discretion to determine if an order is unlawful? Or, or are, are they supposed to? Going back to the Nuremberg trials. You know, kind of, kind of getting into legal matters that I would just be, you know, postulating on. But you know, it's all, it all has to do with the case of the case that's going on. I mean, uh, you know, orders that are overtly illegal you know, on their face, I enlisted have a duty to disobey them. So what are some examples? Can you give some examples hypothetically of what an illegal or unlawful order, order would look like? How, how would anybody even know? I, I, I think people would you know, have to go back on historical cases and, you know, certainly I, I just, you know, I, I guess I'd, you know, any type of case with, with my lie, uh, case in Vietnam was was the biggest uh, case that I can think of, and you know, that that brought out uh, a lot of you know that was overtly firing on uh, unarmed civilians. So, but you know when you get into what defines you know patently illegal orders is you know. That, that's a big gray area, I think. Wow. I was hoping you'd help to clarify it a little, being the experience that you have in the, in the service. What's next for your case, your situation? Now that your, your sentence has been completed, are you now, um, you know, are you put back in the system while you're on appellate leave to, you know, you're on active duty, so are you actively doing things or are you behind a desk? Or what? What? What is next for Terry Lakin? You know, the my even though I am still on active duty, I receive no pay, and and the army has no duties, and I don't have any have to report to anybody in the military other than my appellate attorney. Um, you know, I am seeking out uh, employment, trying to you know get back on my feet financially. Um, you know, I've I've lost 17 years of a potential retirement through the military, and and I just I, I knew that was a risk going in, but I didn't know my my other options didn't sound that great either. So I'm, I'm just pretty much starting over my my career now. Do you have any regrets that you ever raised the Obama eligibility issue in the first place? I don't. I'm at, I'm at peace with it. I I think it's an issue that needs to be resolved somehow, and I I don't know what led me down to trying to resolve this internally with the military. You know, a year and a half before anything, you know, before I took the action that got me court-martialed, um, but since I had already traveled this road, I felt that still complying with orders that I had questions about would be the would be the wrong thing to do also. 
An action fund has been set up to support the defense and the aftermath of this entire issue for Terry Lakin. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, if you'd like to help contribute, um, if you'd like to basically take a stand for something, uh, and if you want to stand with Lieutenant Colonel Terrence Lakin, I'd like you to go to www.terrylakinactionfund, all one word. Terry is T-E-R-R-Y. Terry Lakin, L-A-K-I-N. Terry Lakin Action Fund dot com. And please be generous because we have a man here who is standing for something and he could use our support. He could use our help in making that stand. And you know, more of you need to make these types of stands. Too few of us are willing to do so. Is there anything else you would like people to know either about your experience past or what's coming up for Terry Lakin? Well, just uh, kind of exploring options. I really hope to help out the in incarcerated military troops that I think are the, you know, some, some forgotten heroes in there. And that's a, a population of, you know, troops that maybe, maybe we need to, help out a little bit more and, and then our, our deployed troops and their families have gone through a lot the last 10 years. My heart and prayers go out to them. As do ours, not only to them but to you as well. My guest has been Lieutenant Colonel Terry Lakin and if you would like to help out, if you want to participate, if you want to know more about his experiences and the stand he has taken on behalf of truth and justice, Go to www.terrylakinactionfund.com. Terrylakinactionfund.com. Terry, God bless you, and thank you for taking the stand. You're standing. You're taking a position on behalf of so many more who you will never know directly. Thank you for doing so. God bless you, and uh, I hope everything goes well. Thank you very much, Brent. Thanks so much. Lieutenant Colonel Terry Lakin. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.